obviously I think the wall has been the number one issue um, that Donald Trump has campaigned on and um, it's also I think since day one he's been in office nearly two years now coming up to two years it's the one thing he's really really wanted to do and also I think it's tremendously popular with the American people the idea of building the wall and um, which is of course exactly why the Democrats won't let him have it you know what I mean essentially um, the situation I think is basically this if the Democrats let him have the wall, he's going to win in 2020. And they both know that, you know what I mean? And that for a long time, Trump, I guess, um, put it on the back burner, thinking, well, he'll get to it, you know what I mean? And, and, and he was compromising. Because you know, I think one of the things people realise with Donald Trump, I mean, you know, he's had to compromise. You know, and I think that any politician who takes the White House has to compromise with political elites um, within the GOP and within the Democrats to get done what they want to get done. And I mean, every politician, including ones we don't like, like Obama, has definitely had to do that to some extent, even if they are sort of in favour, you know, with, um, with the media or other groups. So um, I think Donald Trump has had to compromise, but there was a bunch of articles that were published in November and December, um, one from Ann Coulter and one from Tucker Carlson, who were two strong supporters of, of Trump the uh, uh, last two years where they basically said he was sort of, because he was looking like he was wavering on the wall, that he was going to essentially cave on the issue. Um, and let's be quite sure, he does not want to do that. I mean, he's been wanting to build this thing, believe me. But it's just, you know, it, it, the issue is so hard. And this is also a very strange thing. Um, you know, it's believed that the president have this supreme power, and he does have a lot of power. One one good thing that the Bush regime did do, he did give the president this kind of extrajudicial power. Uh, and uh, so in essentially, I think he can build the wall if he was to do it by presidential decree. I think that's possible, but he's held off doing that um, for some reason. I think that if they will continue to deny him the wall, eventually he will do that. But I do believe these articles from Tucker Carlson and Ann Coulter, where they both sort of attack Trump for appearing to go soft on the wall, um, kind of forced his hand in a bit. And I think it, essentially both articles were written to wake him up, to say, listen, you've really got to go ahead with this. And, uh, you know, so he's, for, the, he's now forced the Democrats into this shutdown situation. We've now, I think the, the shutdown is, is around over 20 days, coming up to 20 something days. It's one of the longest, if not the longest shutdown in history. And I think he should just keep at it um, until uh, the Democrats cave. I, I believe the Democrats will eventually cave. And um, I think it's very important that he sticks to it because um, I think he realizes this, and also the Democrats realize, it, which is why they're holding off because they would have they would have caved by now if they didn't know when they do cave. It means Trump's going to win in 2020. So this is a serious battle. Um, Trump is fighting people not only within the Democratic Party; he's also fighting some people within the GOP itself, his own party. Uh, there are you know what's called the globalist cabal, which, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know how you want to describe it or the extent of it, but it's clear that there are, there are elements within both the GOP and the Democrats that belong to the globalists. Um, you know, they always, you know, any war, you know, any war next to Israel, they'll support and they'll fight it. Like, you know, Trump announced recently he wanted to pull out of Syria and then the Bolton guy said, oh, well, yeah, maybe we'll pull out. You know what I mean? So, like, I mean, the president says we're going to pull out and then his secretary of defense says, oh, maybe we'll think about that. And then you know, him and Israel go off and do something else for a little while. Or they delay the withdrawal of troops for a long time. And maybe it takes a year and a half to get troops out. So believe me, these wars are going to continue. And, and sometimes the president doesn't have the full say. Um, because, you know, really the globalist cabal really is that powerful. The deep state really is that powerful. I mean, it really is a kind of non-elected um, behind the scenes government. And, I mean, not to jump ship and talk about another issue, but Brexit is a classic example of the way Brexit is being sabotaged in the UK. This is clearly the work of the globalist cabal. I mean, you know, it's just so obvious. So this is a serious battle that we're seeing at the moment, you know, with Trump. And um, I think he's going to stick to his guns. But, you know, I mean, there are limits to probably what he can do. Um, and I think we must be aware of that. But, like, you know, let's hope he, he wins out. And, um, you know, I guess... If they don't cave, I think maybe after 30 days or, or even six weeks, he'll probably um, restart the government again and, um, and then use a presidential decree to build the wall. But that would be, uh, and declare a state of emergency, which is, um, you know, uh, a good idea, in my opinion. I believe once you declare the state of emergency, it um, relates to a political philosopher by the name of um, Carl Schmitt, who was a contemporary of Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger is one of my big influences philosophically. And Carl Schmitt was a contemporary of his. And uh, they were both part of the conservative um, movement uh, in between World War I and World War II um, in Germany and, and in, in other European countries. They were conservative thinkers. And uh, Carl Schmitt's ideas on the state of emergency 
and um, and uh, political theology are, are very powerful. And I highly recommend you you investigate those. Get those books on Amazon. There's a couple of great books. One called P- Political Theology, and there are books on the state of emergency by Carl Schmidt online that you should check out. I do think he should um, declare a state of emergency. But for now, let's see how he goes with the um, with with the wall. Let's hope that the Democrats cave, and that will probably mean we will be stuck with uh, Trump for eight years instead of four. So um, I think it's going to be a win. I think Trump's going to keep winning. And, um, you know, I think it's great fun the other day when he had those people. What was that about? Who were those people he had? Were those sports people, weren't they? He had a whole bunch of McDonald's for everybody. Yeah. And, of course, the media went into meltdown. And, of course, you know, these are the, the left-wing you know, media. And, of course, they all eat at Whole Foods. You know what I mean? And I don't know if you've been to Los Angeles or whatever. I mean, all the elite, all the globalist puppets, and they all eat at Whole Foods where everything is organic and the water's all pure and everything's pure and beautiful. But, of course, the average citizen, you know, has, has terrible fast food that's probably bad for you. But when, when Trump speaks, puts McDonald's there, he's speaking to the working class, he's speaking to the middle class, and he says, I'm sure Donald Trump eats well sometimes. I'm sure he eats, you know, probably from some of the finest restaurants in the world, but every now and then he has a fucking Big Mac, and I think that's a great thing. You know, I think I actually don't think it's that bad for you. If you, you do eat well most of the time, if you occasionally eat junk food, it's not the end of the world. You know, it's certainly not that bad for you. The fact that he's, what, 70-something? And uh, he seems pretty healthy. He seems like he's going to be around for a while, <laughs> which, again, must annoy the the, uh, the ruling elite in America. As Donald Trump, you know, is a great disruptor, and I think David Lynch said this about him, you know, that regardless of what you think of his politics... David Lynch is a great, sorry, David Lynch, um, Donald Trump is a great disruptor. He had to kind of recant this a little bit um, a day or two later because, you know, I don't know, otherwise he'd lose all his left-wing friends. But, um, you know, many people in Hollywood, and trust me, I could name about 10 names now of people in Hollywood who I know are are right-wing, but I can't fully announce that they are because they sort of keep it on the on the down low or they keep it hidden you know there's a lot more conservatives in hollywood you'd imagine so i think you know i think this kind of thing with mcdonald's and stuff is great you know and um he's speaking the language of the working class he's speaking the language of the average uh, citizen and also it's good fun it's it's a good troll you know troll trump is an excellent troller you know he does it with twitter he does it with different things he does and he also um you know grounded uh what's the name of the horrible horrible woman nancy pelosi i mean she looks like the wicked witch of the west doesn't she i mean i thought i thought hillary clinton was the most unpleasant woman in american politics but you know what i think nancy pelosi is worse um you know i mean hillary Hillary has a kind of lovable quality because she's such a rogue, you know what I mean? That like she has a quality like a, like a gangster that you almost kind of admire. And you know she's killed all these people. She's killed thirty or forty people in a rise to pay. You know, but this you know like the way you might admire Al Capone. You know what I mean? Like you can sort of admire Hillary Clinton because there's just something vaguely gangster about her. You know, like she's a tough woman. You know what I mean? You know, and the fact that Trump defeated her was quite incredible, really, considering what a tough comp- uh, opponent she was. But um, Nancy Pelosi is this fucking toxic. You want to talk about toxic? We talk about toxic masculinity. And then and Schumer. I mean, Schumer is possibly the most revolting politician I think I've ever seen in US politics, in, in the history of the world. I've never seen someone more unpleasant. He has meetings with Soros's son quite regularly. The guy is this creepy, I mean, you know, and horrible person you could ever hope to imagine. So it's, it's this, this weird kind of like Pelosi witch and the Schumer swamp creature now dominating the situation and stopping Americans from having ba- border security. They claim they love border security. Who the fuck are they kidding? They, they couldn't give a fuck. They have only one interest, which is flooding um, immigrants and foreigners through the uh, southern border and, uh, you know, hopefully picking up a few more votes along the way for the Democratic Party. So this is a great disaster. And, um, you know, I think Trump really is um, uh, fighting this now and it's getting serious. And I guess they're having a staring contest now. They're kind of like staring across the room. Who's going to blink first, you know? We'll wait and see, but I don't think it'll be Trump. But we shall wait and see. And if it is Trump who blinks first, then you're going to get the state of emergency. And in the state of emergency, it can be permanent. And when a state of emergency is permanent, you can do anything you want. Think about that. The president can do anything. I like the sound of that. And that's how I win for the day. (laughs) The state of emergency, baby.